Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is a CPD webinar series. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, today we have two excellent talks. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Maz Abd, who is a certain dermatologist uh, in Derby, NHS. And he's uh, going to give us a talk on red legs, which is very common presentation in acute medicine and, and, and uh, on, uh, on general medical wards, as well as in general practice. So Maz, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Naseem and uh, Mansoor for inviting me for this uh, talk. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Maz Abid. I'm one of the consultant uh, dermatologist at the uh, University Hospital of Darby and Burton NHS Foundation Trust. I have a specialist uh, interest uh, in pediatric dermatology and I'm also a skin cancer lead for the trust. Today, my talk is um, about uh, uh, red legs. So a red leg is a massive and uh, uh, pretty generic topic as uh, introduced by Naseem. Uh, the purpose of today's talk is to basically help non-dermatologists in the audience uh, to develop a clinical approach uh, to the evaluation and initial management of patient presenting with uh, red or erythematous legs. <clears throat> I will also then talk about common and life-threatening causes of uh, red legs initial treatment plan and to determine when to refer patients to dermatologists with uh, red legs. I will also go through um, a basic algorithm for diagnosis and uh, management. Uh, if there's any dermatologists in the audience, uh, uh, they may find the talk pretty basic, so apologies in advance. All right, so if you see uh, red legs uh, in adults, you know, uh, mainly, so, so first you have to see whether there is any background red skin or not, or if there is red lesions, uh, red skin, or whether there is any red lesions on normal background of skin. So if there are red lesions on normal looking background skin, remember four common skin conditions. On the right side, you can see cutaneous vasculitis, which is characterized by particle and purpuric rash. Uh, erythema nodosum, another common uh, cause of paniculitis, uh, present with bruise-like lesions, then psoriasis and eczema and purpura. But if there is background red skin, <clears throat> it can further be divided into whether this is unilateral red leg or is it, is it bilateral. So if it's unilateral, always think about infections. And the common infections are cellulitis or erysipelas, which are bacterial. And, and uh, another one is fungal infection. Fungal infection is usually characterized by an active edge. And in, if, it's, if it's bilateral, and think about inflammatory cause. Uh, so the most common ones are venous disorders, uh, again, psoriasis and eczema actually can appear both in both the uh, classifications, you know. Uh, lymphedema, peripheral edema, vesicular bullous dis diseases such as pemphigoid and uh, pemphigus. And very rarely I put as, uh, you know, one for erythromyalgia, which is pretty, pretty, pretty rare condition. All right, so I will talk about uh, some common skin conditions. So uh, cellulitis and erysipelas is, is very common, bact you know, bacterial infection. It, presents in acute medicine uh, day, in, day, day in and out, uh, characterized by localized area of uh, red, painful, swollen skin and, 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 and systemic symptoms. So I've highlighted uh, some differences between the two uh, satellites and erysipelas. Both are bacterial infections. Satellites is mainly caused by, you know, could be caused by staph and strep both. Erysipelas mainly by the streptococcal infection. And the, the level of uh, infection, you know, cellulitis is much deeper in the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue. Erysipelas is more superficial infection. Cellulitis edge is more diffused and erysipelas, it is very well demarcated and sometimes raised. Uh, cellulitis can cause uh, blistering as well and can progress to dermal necrosis. So erysipelas is actually, you know, blistering is much more common and they get superficial hemorrhage into the blisters. So there, there is example on the right side, the top one is more like a cellulitis and the lower one is more of an erysipelas. You can see well demarcated edge and a, and a blister. So coming to the management, uh, you know, follow the trust guidelines. There is always a, a guidelines available in the trust for, uh, the, uh, for cellulitis and uh, uh, follow those guidelines. Contact the microbiology 
if there is no response to the antibiotics in the 48 hours. But the most important thing to remember is if about necrotizing fasciitis, which is a, a, a very high, carries a very high mortality. So any inflammatory markers going high and necrosis of the skin rapidly progressing and a patient really unwell. So defer these patients to the orthopedics usually in some centers, general surgery, because they need uh, surgical intervention. Usually no dermatology intervention is required unless it's a resistant cellulitis or a bullous cellulitis, or if you're unsure about the diagnosis. Uh, usually we do not need to be uh, involved in, in the care of cellulitis. So dermal 500, you can start as an antiseptic wash and regular emollients can be prescribed as for a formulary that will help the uh, you know, skin on the uh, cellulitis. So this is just to show you, it's, it's a busy slide, uh, but just to highlight, uh, I've taken this from the University Hospital of Derby intranet. So every hospital, most of the hospitals in the UK would have this uh, uh, kind of framework where it guides you about which, antibi which antibiotics to use depending on the uh, infection. You know, if it's a low risk infection, the first line usually is, uh, you know, flucloxacillin. And if it's a high risk infection and severe infection, then uh, clindamycin. And if it's MRSA is present, uh, then, you, then doxycycline, and, and then you can consider more uh, stronger antibiotics uh, as per the micro guidelines. Uh, which includes linozilid and, uh, uh, you know, agentamycin, et cetera. So this is just to highlight, you know, that follow the local guidelines. This is an important slide about the, the cellulitis. You know, if, if somebody is getting recurrent cellulitis, now there is evidence, you know, the patch study was done uh, by the group of dermatologists in, uh, and it's, it's in Nottingham. And, and in fact, uh, that was for the multi-centered study, uh, which highlighted that, uh, uh, if prophylactic antibiotics reduce the chance of further cellulitis. So whoever has got anything, two episodes or more than two episodes, uh, uh, please, please consider <clears throat> prophylactic antibiotics. And I usually uh, suggest uh, uh, 250 milligram twice daily for 12 months uh, to prevent further attacks. <clears throat> okay, coming to the bilateral red legs, as I said, bilateral red legs always think about inflammatory skin condition. Bilateral cellulitis is extremely uncommon and very rare. And we do get a lot of referrals from the medic, medics, you know, about bilateral cellulitis. They, they are treating with antibiotics. They're not responding. They're not getting better. And when you look for other clues, you know, it, CRP, white cell count are normal. And, uh, and no wonder they're not responding because, they're, because they aren't, you know, cellulitis. It's a, it's a different diagnosis. So so think about the alternate diagnosis with bilateral red, red legs. So the common ones, you know, with bilateral red legs, inflammatory dis diseases, the common one is venous eczema. We see it, you know, day in and day out. Uh, most common is venous eczema, often seen in middle-aged and elderly patients. And it is associated with the history of deep venous thrombosis. And there is history of uh, multiple episodes of cellulitis, uh, chronic swelling of the lower leg, varicose veins and venous leg ulcers. So on the right side, you can see a typical uh, port, uh, image on the right top, uh, which is a, a venous eczema with scaly and flaky skin with erythematous background. And on the lower photograph, uh, you can see a, a right medial malleolus. There is an ulceration, uh, which is superficial, but it is in keeping with venous ulceration and then the redness, which is in keeping with stasis changes. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, <clears throat> the clinical features are, it can be discrete patches or it can become quite confluent and circumferential, the venous eczema, and if it characterized by itchy, red blistered and crusted plaques, uh, uh, and dry fissured and scaly thick plaques, and most important finding that often, uh, you know, which is a clue to the venous disease is orange brown pigmentation due to hemosiderin deposition that happens because of the <clears throat> leaky capillaritis. So you see these brown orange stain in the legs. All right, so again, to just to highlight, you know, that spec the, the venous disease has got a spectrum. So on the left side of the uh, image is showing, uh, you know, early stages of uh, venous eczema. You can see prominent veins there. You can see scaliness, flakiness, uh, and erythematous uh, skin. And this is typical uh, venous eczema. The middle one is showing ulceration now, 
so this is venous uh, ulceration, and uh, the right side one is a is a is a typical example of uh, lipo uh, dermatosclerosis. So lipo dermatosclerosis is uh, uh, you know is 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 pretty it's pretty common than what people think. So I'm going to <clears throat> talk a little bit more about lipodermatosclerosis. Uh, it is a chronic uh, inflammatory condition characterized by actually subcutaneous fibrosis and hardening in the skin. So skin in inflammation is pretty deep level and it's uh, mainly due to venous uh, insufficiency. And uh, it causes uh, the skin to, you know, the legs, lower legs uh, in particular to become like an inverted champagne bottle, uh, uh, which happens because of the narrowing at the ankles and, and in duration secondary to the, to the fibrotic process. And this often patient complains of that their legs feel like rock hard. So if you touch their legs, you know, it's rock hard, very firm, and they are very high risk of getting, uh, 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 you know, ulceration and infection with even with minor trauma. All right. So this is the image of uh, venous eczema with infected leg, and you can appreciate uh, some raw areas and necrosis uh, there. So if you see this kind of wet, weepy uh, area with raw, raw, uh, with, uh, raw skin there and some necrosis, uh, think about inf uh, infected venous eczema, take a swab. And uh, on the upper part, you can see some uh, hemosiderin deposition. That's what I was talking about. Typical, uh, you know, orange brown discoloration, uh, which is due to leaky capil capillaries. So, how do we manage uh, venous eczema? <clears throat> the first line, everyone, you know, uh, the basic one, just good skin care is important, you know. Uh, keep it, uh, you know, clean. Leg elevation is very important and regular emollients and topical corticosteroids. So take a swab from the skin and uh, as a lot of patients need antibiotics if it's infective. Other thing to consider is potassium permanganate soaks. If it's quite wet or weepy and it's an exudative uh, area, then potassium permanganate scope is like an oxidant. It's, it's an antiseptic. It dries it and it helps in uh, you know, getting rid of the infection quickly. So that's first line can be initiated by anyone. For second line treatment, you know, is compression treatment, compression bandages. Okay, so for compression bandage, we should check peripheral pulses. If peripheral pulses is normal, uh, then there isn't any arterial disease. So they are suitable for compression bandage and that will help the uh, venous flow. Uh, if you can't feel pulses, uh, then ABPI, ankle brachial pressure index uh, is important. That can be measured by the clinical measure department or some, sometime by the tissue viability nurses and in the primary care as well. So if the ABPI is more than 0.8, which indicates suitability for graduated compression bandages, if you can't get suitable ABPI or some people, you know, if you don't get you know, appropriate ABPIs or, or low ABPIs, then they would need couplers. So Dopplers uh, is important. And uh, all right, third line is, I think somebody's uh, not mute. Okay, that's fine. So third line is referral to the vascular team, you know, for surgical intervention, especially if you feel there is also an arterial component or arterial or, or venous mixed disease, then they would benefit from a uh, you know, vascular opinion. So another common condition, lymphedema. Uh, lymphedema is basically a dysfunction of the lymphatic system. It can be localized or diffused. It is classified as a primary or secondary. So primary is mainly secondary to, due to damage. The underdeveloped lymphatic system is usually present at birth. Uh, but secondary is, is impaired in functioning caused by chronic, chronic venous disease, uh, Surgery, we do. See, we often see patients with uh, lymph node dissection, cancer patients. You know, going through the dissection, they end up with lymphedema. Radiotherapy, uh, accidental trauma, injury, or infection that damage the lymphatics, and also uh, important to uh, high, other high risk factors are reduced mobility and obesity. So you can see on the right side uh, uh, the typical features of lymphedema with some eczematous uh, and st uh, stasis changes. And you can see there at the ankles, there's the accumulation of uh, lymphedematous uh, you know, fluid. 
Again, the management, I mean, lymphedema is a massive topic and it, there are experts now in, in the country. So it is a highly specialized field now. Uh, uh, some of the dermatologists do manage uh, lymphedema uh, as a, you know, a special interest, uh, but palliative medicine consultant also manages. So, uh, so if, if, if it's a complex lymphedema, you should refer to the lymphedema team, but main thing is to treat the underlying cause. If there's an underlying cause that should be treated, from the skin point of view, always remember skin care, regular emollient, leg elevation, and uh, antiseptic wash and a topical steroids if there is any eczematous changes on the skin. Uh, this is uh, an image showing lymphedema with cellulitis. So these lymphedema P patients are very high risk for cellulitis. So just to highlight, I mean, I've just put this image to highlight, you know, they, they can be quite uh, tricky to treat and uh, they are very high risk and more they get cellulitis, the more lymphedema get worse long-term. So in such case, if you see these legs with cellulitis, I, you should you know, consider putting these patients on uh, prophylactic antibiotics long-term. All right, so this is the slide, you know, uh, peripheral edema induced skin changes. So sometimes we do get these referral from medics, but uh, off, this is like basically a pedal edema on the legs and uh, we, as medics, we should exclude medical causes like, you know, cardiovascular or renal or liver. Uh, and these patients do not need dermatological input, you know. So the idea is to, you know, treat underlying cause and investigate and treat accordingly. So please, uh, uh, there is no need for dermatological input to make that diagnosis. All right. So psoriasis is, uh, you know, is very common we see all the time. It's a chronic uh, inflammatory skin condition. And you can see on the photograph, it's characterized by uh, uh, red scaly plaques. Uh, they are usually well-defined, but uh, when they get severe, they become very confluent and quite uh, widespread and they, you know, they merge together. So if you see these kind of legs, you know, uh, scaly plaques uh, on the legs, then do look out, do examine the full skin, you know, and the clues would be on the nails. So see the nails. Nails have, will have a, a pitting nails or hyperkeratotic uh, nails or dystrophic nails uh, and discolored nails. Uh, look for the scalp. You'll get a scalp uh, scaliness, rash, or, you know, you know like dandruff-like scalp changes. And do ask about joint pain. Uh, a lot of patients are, have got uh, psoriatic arthritis and, and there's a, and psoriasis, uh, is more common with the uh, positive family history as well. So the management again is, uh, you know, uh, you can, if you see psoriasis, you can just start with topical steroids, you know, something like betnoweight or humoweight, regular emollient, uh, refer to dermatology as an outpatient. Uh, but if it's quite extensive and uh, if you feel that it's, it's, it's subiratodermic or can progress to iratodermic, then it needs to be referred urgently. If they are inpatient, then, they, then best to refer to the on-call registrar. Otherwise, they have to be referred urgently, should be seen within a couple of weeks, ideally. Uh, but the main thing from this slide, you know, is to always remember, do not, if you are suspecting psoriasis, please do not uh, uh, start systemic steroids because that can cause havoc. You know, if once, once you've given systemic steroids to psoriasis patients, when they come off, the psoriasis come back with vengeance and... Uh, so if you're suspecting psoriasis, just remember oral steroids is, uh, uh, you know, should avoid oral steroids you know, and you speak to the dermatologist first. Uh, all right, something about autoimmune vesicular bullous disorder. So the, the two common ones are uh, pamphigoid and pamphigus. So uh, pamphigoid, uh, I've, I've highlighted the difference between the two, but main thing is if you, if you see blistering disease, the first important thing is to exclude drug rash, drug induced causes should be excluded first. So that is very important. Once you have excluded uh, drug rash, then pemphigus and pemphigoid depending on the clinical features. So pemphigus is more common in middle-aged and the blisters are more flaccid uh, on normal looking base. Usually they are generalized and pemphigus is pretty rare. Pemphigoid is more common in elderly patients. You get a tense blisters, you know, and usually there is a background urticaria and redness, very itchy condition. Can be both localized and generalized, but more commonly generalized. And it is much more common than pemphigus. So on the right side, you can see 
this urticated diffuse redness with the, you know, uh, the blister, which is now broken on the lower leg. So this is a, a typical pemphigoid. So please refer dermatology to the dermatology registrar or consultant straight away if you suspect uh, pemphigoid or pemphigus uh, as they would need biopsy and immunofluorescence. And often uh, they need uh, oral steroids uh, uh, in earlier on and uh, topical steroids obviously as well, but they end up uh, on immunosuppressants such as mycophenolate or methotrexate or cyclosporin or azathioprine depending on other risk factors uh, in the patient. But please uh, refer urgently. So this is an uh, example for bullous pemphigoid. On the left-hand side, you can see urticated uh, macular areas. These are extremely itchy. Middle photograph showing a very tense blister on the left dorsum of the foot, and the right side, you know, quite extensive blisters, you know, blistering disease. Uh, and these patients uh, would uh, need an urgent dermatology input, and they need to be put on oral steroids and immunosuppressant uh, early on. They are very high risk of infection as well. I've put this slide, erythromyalgia. Uh, this is quite actually rare. So uh, if you suspect erythromyalgia, just, you, know, you need to refer to dermatologist. The, the triad is uh, intense burning pain, erythema, and increased skin temperature. Primarily affect the feet and the hands. You know, it is chronic and episodic. Again, just uh, to the, the main point is if you suspect erythromyalgia, exclude blood, blood disorders such as myeloproliferative disorder, polycythemia and thrombocytopenia. And the management again is, you know, medical and surgical. I'm not going to go through it. Mainly it's about uh, pain control and symptomatic management. Uh, another common condition uh, that we get referrals is erythema nodosum. It is a, a type of paniculitis, uh, an inflammatory disorder, which affects subcutaneous fat. And they present as a very tender subcutaneous uh, red nodules on the shin, which ends up with like a bruise-like area. Uh, the, the common things need to be excluded is, is infection, uh, streptococcal, or it could be viral infection. And the second main thing is drugs, you know, commonly sulfonamides, amoxicillin, oral contraceptive pills, and non-steroidals. Erythema nodosum is also associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease and sarcoidosis. So we do, we, uh, our workup also includes uh, ACE levels and chest x-ray. And erythema nodosum is also associated with uh, malignancy. So be wary of that as well. So again, the management is basically to treat and investigate underlying cause. Symptomatic management includes you know, a bed rest uh, and non-steroidals. Very rarely we do prescribe systemic uh, steroids, uh, uh, but first we have to make sure that there isn't any infection, sepsis or malignancy. Uh, but please refer to dermatology uh, team because sometimes they need a biopsy as well and further investigations. Uh, another common topic, vasculitis. We've got some uh, renal physician here as well. So uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, the cutaneous vasculitis. Uh, we see in dermatology mainly small vessel vasculitis, you know, uh, and uh, uh, which we rarely present with systemic vasculitis. So basically, vasculitis is a group of disorders in which there are inflammation of blood vessels in the skin. There are, you know, it can present in, you know, wide variety of, uh, you know, clinic spectrum. The commonest things to remember is uh, infections and drugs. Uh, and in most cases that we see in cutaneous vasculitis, there isn't a cause found and disease is usually self-limiting. On the photographs on the right side, you can see patricule and purpuric image, you know, a purpuric uh, rash and the right lower bottom showing uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, purpuric rash, which is typical of uh, HSP, Hinoshonlin purpura, which is usually characterized by abdominal pain, renal involvement, arthritis and skin changes uh, of uh, uh, purpuric rash. So. Uh, do think about HSP when you see that pattern. Again, the management, the main thing to highlight in the management is, is uh, vasculitic screen. However, uh, do check blood pressure regularly. And the most important thing to remember is urine analysis and renal function, because if they've got kidney functions, then the renal team needs to be involved early on. Uh, the, from the skin point of view, pain relief, and, come, and you can manage symptomatically with topical steroids. Oral steroid is rarely needed. However, I do prescribe them if they've got blistering vasculitis uh, on the skin and 
these patients should be referred to the dermatology team for uh, assessment. And we don't always do biopsy, but if there is any doubt or if the renal team wants or rheumatology team wants, we do biopsy as well, uh, because sometimes it's not straightforward to biopsy kidneys. So, uh, so, we, so we do consider biopsy uh, in such cases. All right, to just summarize, uh, uh, we did, we discussed red legs. So if it's chronic or acute, if it's chronic, uh, I think if you're in the hospital setting or even in the primary care, just check what dermatology have suggested and you can simply check and reinstate those plants and often you will get it right. Uh, however, if, if it's uh, acute, if it's unilateral, think about infection. If it's bilateral, think about inflammation, okay? The take home messages are basically initial treatment can be initiated by any team. We have discussed when to involve the dermatology team. Uh, other thing I want to highlight is you know, uh, medical photography. Good photos can be really helpful to plan the visit and to prevent any delay in the advice. We can advise through the photographs. You know, we can receive photographs and again, we can easily advise a lot of cases and sort them out. Uh, last but not the least, cellulite is, is a medical uh, condition, usually does not require any dermatological intervention. So just a quiz, I don't know whether how many people we have here, but I'm going to just pick on my colleagues here. Uh, uh, Mansoor, any, please shout out the diagnosis. I think he's on mute, so anyone else? Erythema nodosum. Excellent, Naseem. Brilliant. This one? Anyone else? I think it's uh, all are mute probably. So it's again an example of lymphedema. Okay. This is uh, psoriasis, venous eczema. Anyone, anyone want to comment on that? Tense blister? Uh Mars, just hang on one second. Uh, let me unmute all of them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So, so That's people Pemphigoid. can unmute themselves. Yeah. Pemphigoid. It looks like Amir Gangro is here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I've uh, finished, hopefully on time. Uh, and Naseem, it's up to you whether you, I, I'm thank happy you. to take questions or whether in the end, uh, after Imran's talk. No, I'm we'll take questions you. in the end, uh, Mars. Yeah, that's we'll fine. We'll take questions in the end. Um, Okay, so next speaker we have is uh, Dr. Imranul Haq, who is a consultant in emergency medicine at Doncaster. Uh, Imran, you can share your slides now. Imran, can you hear me? I've made you the host so you can share your slides. Very good. Yes, you can see your screen. Go ahead. Imran, you maybe maybe you are on mute, so you need to unmute yourself, please. We can see your screen. We can't hear you. Imran, we can't hear you. It has. Imran, we can't hear you. Unmute yourself, please. Is it done? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, excellent. So please, can everybody uh, mute themselves? Uh, please mute yourself, except the speaker. Thank you. Oh, oh no. Okay. Uh... Sorry, give me one minute. Um, well, okay, thank you everybody um, for joining us. Um, so I would like to present um, an interesting case um, with a nice ending. Um, and I would like to stress all, all of you 
uh, never miss this cases because uh, they can have detrimental consequences uh, for your career and for the patient also. And this is a, a case which has been dealt recently by me and um, refer to pediatric on call. And that's the only case I would like to present because, um, because this seems to be very significant. Um, so I would like to, the next slide tells you about what is this about cases. And it's all about the, and this is um, all the nurses, what a pediatric nurse wrote in her presenting and uh, at history of presenting complaint. So um, a few months ago, uh, I was on shop floor and um, 20 months old. Ooh, my consultant is calling me. Okay, my consultant colleague. So um, 20 months old baby boy uh, brought by mom um, with presenting complaint, not moving left arm since 10 a.m. And um, as per history of presenting complaint, and according to mom, um, they been out for shopping and uh, came home and mom put uh, baby boy to bed as he was tired. And he woke up around 10 a.m. and the mom noted that, that there is a swelling and the reduced movement around the left elbow. Um, mom was unsure and uh, brought him to ED. On clinical examination, he was alert. This is all as per assessment of a staff nurse, pediatric staff nurse, and uh, good color. No obvious deformity and no obvious tender areas um, around the elbow. Uh, supination, so she was curing about pulled elbow. So that's what we do, uh, supine the wrist and flexion at the elbow attempted. No click felt at that time. However, following this maneuver, patient started to move his left arm. In terms of past medical history, nothing significant. And according to the history from a nurse, from uh, patients, there was no input from the social services in the past. I was asked to see this patient as the department was very busy and No, that is very wrong. Uh, um, I think so. Can you all hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Ron. You all right? Yeah, but the, no, the presentation is um, it's having problem with the downloads, basically. Oh, uh, I no, can, we, we, I we, we see were seeing the presentation. What happened? Show you the pictures. Uh, the x-rays are not coming. New share, okay. Desktop. Share. Sorry for this technical problem I'm having. Um, Let's see if this works. <clears throat> so I went to see the patient and, and um, as per rule of clinical examination, oh no. Uh, Have you saved it somewhere that you can actually show us separately? Yeah, that out? is the reason behind uh, the, so the correct one, which is displaying on the screen. Uh, I don't know what happened to that slide, which is... Would it be possible to, to to just let us know what the X-ray showed or some of the so features? The X -ray, yeah, I think so. I need to go with this one. I'm sorry. Um, it been sent. I've sent you that um, um, X. The can you download on your side? 
No, I wouldn't be able to, Imran. Uh, you've not, you've not sent me the presentation. I'll yeah, send you through WhatsApp. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, 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 no, I'm having difficulty here. But anyhow, so the X-ray was taken, uh, which shows, um, so as per examinations, there was no swelling or tenderness around the elbow, but definitely there was swelling around the wrist, and he don't, did not like it, uh, my touch, uh, during examinations. So I requested the X-ray of the wrist, and the X-ray of the wrist showed uh, that both, uh, he had distal radius and ulnar fractures, and they were a spiral uh, with callus formation. So callus formations in the 20 months usually takes 10 days. So it, it was a 10 day old injury, uh, but there was no clear cut history um, from the mom. And um, so uh, with keeping in mind all the clinical pictures and imaging, I went to see the patient again and find out uh, that um, there were social services involved in the past, okay? And he was presented twice in the ED department, one at age of 12 months, and the other, the second time, he was presented at 14 weeks, uh, 14 uh, months uh, with a head injury. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to show you the x ray. Are you able to uh, share that one um, by any chance, Mansur? Imran, uh, I'll have a look. Imran, can I just actually ask you? We have lost your slides. Would you be able to go back to your slides? Because I think we've got your background um, or the sort of uh, the wallpaper. Go yeah. back to your slides, please. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I should have shown you the x rays, but the, even the x rays are not coming on this. Okay. Which is. Maybe just go back to your presentation and then talk to us about your. And uh, I'm very sorry that X Y is not coming to this. No, that's a different thing. Just, just no. go back to your presentation, Imran. Just go back to your presentation and uh, we can talk about it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, no, I'm trying my best, but it's just, if I go back to the presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the file download. But that is not the file which I wanted to show. Uh, it's it's on WhatsApp. It's not coming on my screen, interestingly. Anyhow, I, on the basis of... This is a very different one. Yeah, that's I a different one. Got, Anyhow. I think we've got the slides. Yeah, we've got the slides. So we can, you can just talk, through, talk us through the slides, yeah? Yeah, I'm sorry for the technical issues. Don't worry, we all have been through this. Yeah, okay. So the x-ray shows spiral fractures, distal radius and ulna, which is very unusual presentation we hear, um, in this uh, age group because usually the periosteum is so thick that um, more likely you are going to see buccal fracture. But two fractures, uh, especially of uh, long bones, uh, raise the suspicion of non-accidental injury, um, which is a recurring problem um, and it's a duty of clinicians to be as vigilant as possible. Um, and safeguarding should form part of every pediatric consultations, especially in, in this presentation. Um, and, and NAI can be presented in various forms, especially bruises, bites, lacerations, abrasions, thermal injuries, and fractures. And most commonly fractures which are associated with non-accidental injury includes spinal fractures. So you will find some bruises on the back along with a stab deformity or stappings behind between the two spinal processes. Rib fractures, fractures of the fractures at different age of healing, ages of healing, and fracture of the long bones, especially if a child or kid is less than two year old.
and this child was presented in any when he was 12 months old and uh, with metaphyseal corner fracture of a distal tibia which is very specific unless and until proven otherwise should raise high suspicion of non-accidental injury so it was missed and he was later referred to fracture clinic seen in fracture clinic and then discharged later so, so in so in brief, in all cases of suspected NAI, children's services should be involved, which includes pediatric on-call consultant, uh, and in some cases we have to involve the police and social services. We have to keep them on board, um, and um, the most important thing in the these cases is to um, identify other children's at risk um, at home uh, with the family. Uh, in this uh, in this history, um, yes, clinical examinations uh, and do a full clinical examinations from A to Z when you are suspecting NAI or any child who presents with uh, injury or any kind of trauma in the form of bruises, bites, lacerations, abrasions, thermal injuries, as well as fractures, as in this case. Um, and um, once I took the history, it was very clear that there were involvement of social services in the past, and there was uh, involvement of police also. Uh, but that history was not given by the mom. Uh, and, and we did not have any kind of systems so that we can track them down. Uh, usually in some hospitals, there is a system by which you can easily find out that they are on resist, register or they are on um, special need children, so and so. Uh, so that's end of my presentation. I'm sorry that I'm not able to show you the X-rays, uh, but okay, uh, X-rays. Uh, I, I I can actually ask Amir Kangru, who has got the X-ray, will be able to show it to you. So Amir, um, if I just make you the host uh, for a, a second or so, if you could just show the X-ray and then uh, just oh good, excellent. Thank you very much, yeah. Amir. Again. And then and uh, then make me the I'm host again, is, if that's all right. Just uh, I'll, I'll make you the host, and then make so me the host. Mm. Sorry, I wanted to discuss two more cases, but because... Uh, 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 I mean, you are the host now, so we uh, share the X-ray. Excellent. Yeah, that was the, oh, good. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amir, once again, for your help. So as you can see, that he has got a spiral fracture or oblique fracture of distal radius and ulna with some callus formation. If you can see my arrow, there is a callus formation is there. So callus formation is a 20 months old. It usually takes 10 to 12 days. Uh, oh, yes, that's, thank you very much. Uh, and you can see there is no soft tissue swelling around the wrist also. So almost it's more than four to five days old injury. And I would like to show you the another, which is a chip fracture of the distal tibia, unless and until proven otherwise. Again, I would like to stress on metaphyseal or Salter Harris II chip fractures, distal radius or distal, ulna, um, distal tibia or distal femur. Highly suspicious of NAI. Uh, if Amir can show that one also. I don't have the other one. Okay, you don't have the other one. Okay. Okay, not a problem at all. Thank you very much, I think. So, um, can I Sorry just ask you... Issue. No, can I just ask you... So, um, how did... Obviously, you have actually sort of talked about the presentation and the... Uh, you know the social service aspect of it, but what was how, what was the outcome at the end? Could, did you, so could you... uh, he was referred to. Uh, he's now in foster care. Mm -hmm. uh, he's away from his biological dad, and he's away from his mom. Okay. Because mom was living with uh, her new boyfriend, and um, uh, she was at work all night, and um, child was with her uh, new partner wife partner okay thank you that very much was another uh, thank you very much for that
Okay, okay. Um, Iran, we'll have a lot of questions actually. So um, I have um, to ask Mars and, and both of you, uh, if any questions for Imran, please you can actually share that in the chat box. Uh, Mars, can we start with a Q&A session? I've got lots, lots of questions for you and I'm just a bit mindful that we need to actually... One time at six o'clock. So I'll start with the questions uh, and thank you for responding to someone in the chat box. So the first question from Imran Aziz from Wigan. Erysipelas, I would not say it's common, we really see that. Um, any, anything about erysipelas? I know you've actually mentioned that in the slides, but how common is it and uh, what should uh, general medics do about erysipelas? I mean, erysipelas is pretty common. It's quite a, basically a bacterial infection and should be treated uh, depending on the severity of the uh, uh, severity of the disease. So I don't know exact, uh, you know, uh, how common it is, but it's relatively common bacterial infection and it's characterized by the superficial layer of the uh, skin and should be treated with oral antibiotics if patient is well. If patient is unwell or have got uh, very high inflammatory markers and you feel that uh, they need IV antibiotic, then they should be admitted. Okay, thank you. Um, there is another question from Imran. Um, uh, we see a lot of patients who have edema of the skin and it is red on both legs and one would have dressing on it with beeping uh, ulcers. Um, I don't know actually, that would probably that was just probably a statement rather than a question, but uh, probably to add to that, yes, I do, when I do my ward rounds, see a lot of patients with um, uh, dressings and sometimes, you know, and I, I have been guilty of that, just kind of move on or get the nurses to kind of actually review the ulcers or the legs <laughs> later on. And then the patient gets discharged, we never get to see the, the wound or the ulcers. Um, how common is that when you get a referral mass from, from general medics or surgeons or any other specialties that they, they have not looked into it themselves and they just actually ask for an opinion because someone's got weeping ulcers uh, i think uh, a medical team some some i mean either a junior doctor or a, or, or, or a consultant or register i mean some of them do you know see them before referring to dermatology i think in my, my experience is uh when we go there you know sometimes that's more challenge because if they've got dressings on uh, patients become unhappy you know if they've recent if they've just been changed uh in the morning and we come back in the afternoon asking to be reviewed i think that's more of a problem i don't see medical team do see them at ward round so sometimes you know by the registrar depending on who's done the ward round so my experience is slightly different i think they do see them and they do refer them and i think what we as a dermatologist have to time it you know the way when we have to tell them that we are coming at Per, uh, certain time for example if the patient is referred in the morning we, to, we tell the nurses in the in the ward that we'll come at around three or between three and four so please take out the dressing so that we can have a look and don't do, do the dressing you know uh, so that uh, we, we we see that wound together so we do plan that way you know and it does be work better Exactly. It's a, it's a nuisance actually for the patient and for the nursing staff as well, but it should be timed appropriately. Thank you very much for that. Uh, from Siddharth, uh, have a boy to everyone. Uh, two questions. You can have venous ulceration and venous skin changes with varicose veins. Is that something you rule out before labeling them as red, red legs? I, I mean, the, the one of the common things is, you know, of uh, bilateral red legs, uh, you know, in my talk is, is inflammatory disorder and venous eczema would come into that. So, uh, so bilateral red legs, you know, always think about uh, inflammatory disorders and venous eczema is, is part of that spectrum, you know, of one of the common conditions to cause bilateral red legs. Okay. Um, I hope so that uh, Dr. Abed is actually answered the question. Uh, another question from uh, Sutta so was the non-surgeons, APPI can be falsely normal in diabetics. Yeah, and diabetics is more tricky and we often end up doing uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we do Dopplers, you know, mostly. So unless if, the, if, if you can't feel the pulse, if you can feel the pulse, dorsalis pedis uh, or posterior tibial, then you don't even need, uh, uh, you know, you don't even need uh, ABPI. <coughs> but if you can't feel the pulse and ABPIs are, you know, uh, not normal or sometimes they are raised actually in, in diabetic and unreliable, and often these patient needs a Doppler oh. assessment. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for that, Mars. Um, role of antibiotics in pemphigoid. Um, uh, this question asked Dr. Kangu. That is a great question. I mean, antibiotics, uh, we do prescribe antibiotics uh, as a sort of almost first line in pemphigoid. <clears throat> I mean, steroids, topical steroids, and uh, but those antibiotics are not just for infection. They are mostly inflammatory in nature, such as doxycycline and limecycline, which have got uh, anti-inflammatory property. 
and they, and they have an excellent, uh, you know, if the disease is mild and moderate, uh, they can be managed with uh, sometime with topical steroids along with uh, uh, doxycycline 100 milligram once a day or limecycline 408 milligram once a day for, you know, uh, for six weeks, something like that. And we, in the meantime, we can do biopsies and things. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. I think that's one of, that's part of the treatment, you know. Thank you. Um, another question uh, from Sadhav was, um, is red leg a relative contraindication to medications or treatment which increases the risk of uh, VTEs, so such uh, tamoxifen? Yeah, I've already answered that. I don't think necessarily it is. Red, I mean, red leg is, is a, you know, you've got many, uh, you know, conditions in red leg. So, so not necessarily tamoxifen or drugs like tamoxifen, which increases thrombobolism would be a contraindication. It has to be assessed case by case. Thank you, Maz. I've, I've just seen a reply as well. Also, just because we're recording this session, so some people may want to kind of actually hear that and may not be able to see the chat. Another question from Iran. I know you've already answered it, but you can actually say that um, as well. Can I ask what is a legal position regarding out of hours uh, patient uh, asking uh, to take picture and then send it to the dermatology team? So picture sending out of hours um, through the, um, you know, whatever channels uh, to the dermatology team. I think I'm just trying to understand that question because... Um... We, I do not accept page, uh, photos directly from patients. So is Imran here? Imran, can you put the scenario yeah. what you were exactly you're asking, you know? So, yeah, so I'm not out sure of which ours, you... Out of ours, there's a patient who comes in. Dermatologists yeah. usually are not on call. Yep. At least in where I live. And uh, so I sometimes ask the patient to send, take a picture and send it to me. And mm -hmm. then I send it to the dermatologist. So yeah, patient don't send it to the dermatologist. I send it to the dermatologist. Yeah, if you send it to, to the dermatologist. At, at 8 o'clock at night, believe me, medical illustration will not be there. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, we do take photos. You know, do we do accept patients from any medical uh, doctors, you know, even nurses as well. So uh, personally, I wouldn't uh, uh, give access uh, to patients to directly email. But if, who, if it's coming from medics, yes, it should. But it should be, uh, you know, agreed. That you and it should be uh, uh, compliant with confidentiality and data protection. So it, I've been, for example, in our trust, you know, we have a generic uh, email for acute dermatology. So judges and the on-call registrar look after those. So, so what happens is whoever you know, a GP or or the medical team can send photos directly to that email. So that is protected. So that is an agreement. So that should be a pathway and agreement uh, prior to it. So. Uh, so, so that, uh, you know, somebody is looking after that, uh, you know, email uh, uh, address and, uh, and I'm, I presume you would then speak to the on-call registrar or, or, or consultant as well then to discuss the case. Is that right? I mean, yeah. So what I would do is ask the patient to take a picture, mm -hmm. email it to me. I will then use NHS.net account yeah. to send it to dermatologist because in our hospital mm -hmm. at Wigan, the... Mm -hmm. Uh, what you call the dermatology registrar is in Salford, which is yeah. at least an hour away. Uh, so it's not as straightforward that, oh, I can just talk to, or they can come and see the patient or something yeah. like that. We do have a dermatology department, but that's a nine to five dermatology department on working days. So yeah. the issue was that I used to do that. And then a dermatology registrar said that that is not legal. Yeah, but I think what I you have to make sure if you're if you're I taking was just a... wondering why is it not legal? Because you know the patient has sent me the picture. I have not taken patient's picture on my phone. It's mm -hmm. patient's phone, and they have sent it through their own volition. I mean, in one case, even the patient's father actually went out because they, he couldn't get a you know signal. So he went out of the hospital to get the signal to send it to me. Uh, and uh, I then uh, I think it's fine to send if it's if the patient is if, if, if the patient is email address it would be the my hospital email address which anybody can get from mm -hmm. the hospital website yeah I think that's fine I think if if the patient is sending to your uh, NHS email account and you have uh, and you have no problem with that then I think uh, that is fine uh, I don't think uh, this is illegal the problem is if the patient is sending to your hotmail or any any other and non NHS account that is a problem there because uh, 
uh, that is not allowed you know but if you're sending to nhs account we patient do send to my secretary uh, you know account and then my secretary send it to me you know because i don't want to be directly in, involved with patients so from your point of view i think i i i think it's fine i don't think it's uh, illegal i don't know whether amir gangro anyone else yeah. is around you know yeah, who so, can comment so on it so we have actually we have got amir and sadaf actually um, uh, actively debating about this so sadaf and amir can i ask you to unmute yourself and yeah. publish some light on this so uh, this is something we do all the time as in general practice actually i did this morning as well there was a child in out of hours who mom phone five month old had some rash so i just asked her to send pictures on my nhs email i viewed the pictures and then phoned her back and uh, said it's okay it was chicken pox so similarly those uh, uh, nhs email pictures can be downloaded on my uh, NHS computer, mm -hmm. and then I would send it to as a Delhi dermatologist to dermatologist as well. Yeah. And we do uh, we do have for e consults as well, in which patients can upload pictures on it, and they can send it to us for a consultation. And those pictures can be viewed. So there are many ways, but you have to use a secure platform. You cannot use your personal email, and that's absolutely fine. So Consultant Connect is another thing that uh, we are using in Wales. I don't know in England if you use it. So there's in Consultant Connect app, there is a photo you can take and they can send it to your email as well. Directly. Yeah, cons yeah con Amir, Consultant Connect, uh, we are doing in Derby as well. And it has been yeah. uh, you know, great feedback from both primary and the, uh, yeah. the secondary care. So that's a great platform. You know, okay. Consultant Connect works really well. Thanks, Amir, for that helpful contrib contribution from primary care perspective. Uh, Dr. Ms. Japavoy, have you got something to say? Yeah, it's it's a it's a very uh, different perspective, um, particularly mainly because I do breast work and we don't mm -hmm. accept any direct photographs from the patient. I think because of lots of legality issues. Yeah. Um, a, I think, and first of all, uh, like Ma said, um, you know, it should either be emailed to a secretary or to a generic account because. Personally, none of us would want to share our personal email addresses, either the hospital one or the NFS net one. So even if it is sent through a portal, um, one of the questions that always comes up, and I know some hospitals have been sued because of this, that how can you be absolutely sure that this is a patient's own photograph? You know, a... I mean, this could be anyone XYZ photograph that the patient has been sent. I mean, these things do happen. So there's no way that you can prove that you gave the advice based on picture that was sent to you. And there was no way that you could prove it. You can ask the GP to send a photo because there would be some witness that a medical person has actually verified the patient's identity before it has been sent to you. So we don't accept anything directly from the patient. Okay, uh, that's really helpful and important to come as you know, and obviously, um, as I said, uh, I do get my uh, secretary receiving emails from the patient, but never directly to me and it goes through uh, someone else. But yes, pictures, we don't really kind of actually see pictures in, in real medicine as such. Um, Dr. Habib Agban is actually here. You, you said something in the comment. Do you would like to say something? Uh, unmute yourself and share your perspective about pictures and only if you want to. Yeah, I'm unsure. Thank and you. So can hear me. Yes, I yeah, can I hear you. Yes. Yeah, I don't think we should be. Uh, I agree with Sadaf's comment. We should not be using any of uh, uh, telecommunication which is not approved by NHS. Number one. Number two. NHS hospital email should not be used. It's only NHS separate emails, which is a um, I don't know what it is. NHS.com or whatever it is that should be used. No person hospital. Uh, email should never be used. No photograph should be downloaded on your personal mobile. Uh, this is uh, not allowed by NHS, uh, sorry, GMC or MDU. They strictly said do not download any picture on your own personal mobile. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Habib. Thank you, Dr. Babi. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments from anyone else? I'm going to move on to the next question. Just one, just one more thing, Mansoor. It's, yes, uh, it's good. No, normally, uh, uh, Mars would know this mm -hmm. as well. For medical photography, you need uh, consent. consent. Mm -hmm. yep. So whether whether it's a written consent or you need to make sure you document the consent has been taken to yep. share the pictures with somebody else. Yep. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much. I think, Mars, uh, sorry, we've been with a lot of questions. Uh, you could see that how dermatology has... Uh, 
uh, generate a lot of uh, questions and an interesting uh, sort of debate there. Um, Imran, uh, if you're still on online with us, um, are you there, Imran, or have you disappeared? Yeah, he is actually. Um, Imran, can you just say yes or no if you're around? I can't hear you, Imran. Imran, are you around? Okay, Imran may not be around. That's fine. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mars, and thank you very much, Imran. Uh, it was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, really enjoyed the dermatology section. Imran, sorry about your technical. Oh, Imran is here. Imran, um, it's, yeah, thank you. Just a very thank quick. You very much. Uh, thank you. Very, just a very quick question, Imran. And um, it's been almost about less than two decades since I've actually last done my A and E uh, job at LGI, and you know how busy uh, Lisa and family has been, um, especially in, in terms of your sort of uh, uh, field and specialty. I just want to ask you. You you, you really highlighted a very relevant case there. Um, is there a particular sort of training that the nurses and doctors in A and E actually do undergo to sort of identify, spot something like this, and not to kind of actually offend and confront some uh, really genuinely concerned parents or relatives or actually or guardians who bring patients uh, and children to hospital uh, to a knee department. And what sort of training do you actually have? And, and, and also, do you have a nurse champion who probably knows how to sort of manage these things? And probably the question should go to Armin as well uh, in the primary care if they've got something like this. So, Iman, you start first. <clears throat> so, one of the medentary courts, we have got a safeguarding level three medentary course for all staff, especially for those who works on shop floor, who works in pediatrics, who works in ED and some other relevant specialties. And this is in line with good medical practice. And it's also in line with the CQC. CQC also recommends to have these safeguarding level three course for all the staffs involved. Uh, even this course is so important that the CQC uh, strongly recommends, first of all, and um, rates based on whether how many staffs have gone through this course or not. Yes, you are right. Uh, we have got a special consultants with a special interest dealing with such cases. And then we have got um, designated uh, pediatric consultants who deal with these cases. So whenever these cases come up, and this is a recurrent problem, as we all know, all, uh, almost there are 14 million children in UK and 58,000 children are in uh, need um, or are at risk, according to NSPCC. So we just need to be more okay. vigilant, uh, especially if um, dealing with kids. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not just fractures, it's uh, bruising or bites or lacerations or wounds. They can also uh, come up. Um, and raise suspicion of NAI. Okay, thank you very much. That's really helpful, Imran. Uh, Amir, have you got anything to say from the yes. primary care perspective? I, yes, Mansoor, uh, uh, Imran is absolutely right. In, in, in primary care as well, uh, all the doctors or clinicians who are generally involved with uh, pediatric care or children, uh, they have to do a level three uh, safeguarding course. It's a mandatory course. They have to update every year as well. And all the other staff, non-clinic staff, will still have to do like a level one or two safeguarding course as well. So it is something that's mandatory in primary care. Okay, thank you very much. I think I'm, I'm going to actually call it a day today. Uh, thank you very much for both excellent presentations and an interesting sort of debate. Thank you, Thomas Matthew, for your um, uh, attention. Uh, much appreciated. Um, we are not going to have any more sessions for the next two months and we'll be back in August um, by the grace of God and we will be talking um, and, and, and discussing more relevant topics since then. If you would like to uh, participate or, be, or present, please let me or Dr. Nakwi know and that'll be great. Thank you very much everyone and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.